Welcome to Lift Your Leg. This is Monique Anstey from the Naughty Dog in Victoria, BC, author of As a Dog Thinketh. And Jill Brown from Calgary, Alberta, the bag lady. Matt Twitty with Start to Finish Dog Training in Cherokee, Alabama. How are you guys tonight? Very good. And thanks for coming back with us, Matthew. Yeah, I think this is a really good topic. I wanted to be part of it. Part of. Tonight, we are talking about what has happened to balanced training. Where has it gone? Because as I look around, I don't see balanced training. How about you two? I don't see a lot of it now either. I'm seeing uh, both sides, like extreme either side of it. I don't, I don't really fit in anywhere. I realize that there is, there can be harm that happens to dogs from bad positive training, the same way that there can be from balanced training. Over the last, I don't know, in, in our efforts to fight for tools and stuff like that, there are times where you really question, like, do we need to fight for this stuff? Partially because you see so much bad being done with them. Like, it's, whoa, what happened to dogmanship? What happened to reading a dog and understand? Now, keep in mind, like, I'm no wilting flower. Like, I'll correct one in three seconds. But there's a lot of correcting dogs out of drive. There's a lot of, um, there's just so much to talk about in this subject. Like, it's just, it's really, this is, a, this is one to unwrap for sure. I think for me, yes, I will correct dogs and I probably correct harder than others, but that means my corrections are few and far between and I don't have to. And then the rest of it is fun and games and the dogs want to be with me. Dogs enjoy being in my company and they're learning that way. But I'm not going to nag them. If a correction is needed, I'm not going to nag them. I'm just going to get it over and done with, make my point and get it done. But then it's all about harmony and fun and enjoying each other. And I think that's a piece that's gotten lost. Like we all get dogs so we can enjoy them and live with them and so they can make us laugh. But I don't hear a lot of laughing going on anymore. You know, to jump in, and, and how many videos do you watch on the internet where it's some, uh, and I'm talking pet dogs. Let, let's just preface this for a second. And and we're going to cover pet dogs where they're walking these dogs on a loose leash and the dogs just look disheveled. And it's like mediocre leash work, but the dog looks disheveled and they're showcasing it. And it's hold on. This is not this is just a dog that's been suppressed. Like it's not a dog that's trained. It's a dog that's been suppressed. Yes. And that, that in itself lends to something you guys were talking about on one of your previous podcasts where you were talking about what does a trained dog look like? It doesn't look suppressed. No. And we see people doing this suppression in the name of balanced training. And we see it on the competition side too. For me, there are, Terry Arnold always said, you got the correctables and the correctables were stay when I tell you, come when I call you and stay with me. Yeah. And anything beyond that was just a trick. It was just a trick. Like it was making the dog get into drive and figuring out how to get the dog in drive and keep them there. But all of these are, are things that are going to happen when a dog is in drive. So if a dog is wanting to chase something, stay a correction for not staying would be happening while the dog's in drive. If the dog's wanting to leave you to go chase a rabbit, the correction for not staying with me would be while the dog is in drive. Yeah. Or not coming. A lot of people are correcting dogs when they're not in drive. And it it takes them to a, a very low place. Yeah. And this isn't even... It's a big topic. The low drive part. I just had a puppy here and the puppy hasn't connected to her person. And I have only had her a day and I really like this little puppy. Really like this little puppy. And it became clear to me that this dog has just had structure. Everything in her life has just been structure. There's been no fun. There's been no enjoying her. Now, I shouldn't say this because I'm not living their life. But that's what the dog told me. Because the first time I blew a zerbot on her belly, she looked so stunned. She had no idea what to do. It can happen on both sides. Like, we have to enjoy our dogs and treat a puppy like a puppy shouldn't be getting the structure of a 
a dog of, that's biting people. Or of what you want. Like, you want to be teaching puppies when they're young, for sure, because they're little sponges. But you shouldn't be expecting what you're expecting from your adult dogs two years down the road. I agree, Jill. But what are you teaching them? Like, Before they've connected to me, I'm not teaching them much. But what I I'm saying is you don't, you don't want, if you don't want dogs jumping up on you, when they're babies, that's the time to reward them when they're four on the floor. Don't let them jump up on you for six months and then all of a sudden start training it. That's what I'm getting at. There's okay. a lot of that. There is a lot of that where we've allowed the behavior to go on for so long. And then the dog finally gets this wallop of a correction and then it like shakes their whole world. I, I feel like we're just not breeding stronger dogs. Like we're just not breeding stronger dogs. And so what used to work is, is changing, like it's evolving. I, I know that when I first started giving obedience clinics, the dogs were stronger. Now I'm uh, out of a, a room of 20 dogs. I, I may find one that is in the right mind frame for me to correct it. I don't say no to my puppies, not at the beginning. For me, as a Border Collie breeder, like I, I want to see dogs that can, they have to be able to handle pressure. They need to learn from it. They need to rise to it. They need to, to not shrivel up to it. So for me, I'm seeing a lot of like champion, mock, ratch, rock titles being bred to those same titles, dock diving, fast cat. When you do that kind of breeding, you might have all the alphabet soup that you wanted. But the that breeding, none of those things tell you how a dog handles pressure. Yep. And so what our traditional obedience titles told us was that a dog could handle advanced training. They could handle advanced. They could handle a lot of pressure. Utility shows if they can handle pressure or not. It definitely does. And so, and herding and, and things like that, sh Schutzen shows that, or IGP, sorry. It shows that they can handle an amount of pressure. They are definitely better markers for, am I going to get a dog with a little bit better, better mental fortitude? Not always, but definitely a, a, a step up. And I, I think that's what's really lacking is mental fortitude. I find that every weekend, like I see dogs that just don't have the mental fortitude to handle the advanced training. And so now the techniques have to change. Like I can stress a dog out by shaping. I don't have to get physical with a dog anymore. I can make this dog want to run to its crate by just making it think through a problem. You can make me run to a crate if you try and shape me too. I hate shaping. It's not recommended for people with ADHD. I'm not saying you're wrong. But it definitely, <laughs> it definitely, it, it, it definitely is the brain punch instead of the physical punch. You know what I'm saying? Like it's some of these dogs couldn't handle, couldn't think through the cookie. They're definitely not going to be able to think through the pinch collar. And as we're watching, like some of our older trainers who are brilliant dog trainers, they're still stuck on the dog's mental fortitude from the past. And so everything's a nail. I think it depends on who. It does, for sure. But I also wonder, well, we're getting on so off topic, but I wonder if we go there with age. I think age might take us there, where and you just get less tolerant. Yeah, and probably experience too. If you surround yourself with field labs or, or crazy high drive Malinois, I'm sure that reaching for a correction first is just normal. But when you have a sweet, soft Sheltie or a Papillon or a, something that's afraid... Not that you couldn't have a field lab that is soft, but like when you have those things and you just reach for the correction, like we're doing the disservice. And I see this a lot in people that are really good dog trainers. Like we're not talking about bad dog trainers, but they've just not softened with time. So we're talking about what happened to balance training and one of my thoughts is, I think, and this does fit in with what you're saying there, we, we get so used to what we're doing that we stop looking and actually paying attention to what's being said. We forget about feeling timing. We're just going into rote. This is what I do. This is what I'm going to keep doing. 
rather than actually listening to the dogs involved. So it's that feel and timing piece just gets omitted. It does. It does. And like for me, like there are some brilliant trainers that have incredible timing. And so I think that, and they're really good with pressure. So like they're really good with pressure. They've got incredible timing. And then they try to teach that to somebody less talented. Um, it, it could be a mitigated disaster, especially if we're talking about a dog that's got no mental fortitude. So that's a, it's such a hard topic because you're like, we're advocating for purely positive dog training. We do different stuff than that. We're also not. We're also not advocating for the other side of the extreme. Like there, there is another side of the extreme to this that we as what we consider balanced trainers have to bring in and call out just the same way that we talk about purely positive problems. We have to talk about the other side of this. And there is another side of this. And, oh, I and- see so many thug trainers destroying dogs and... I don't even want to call myself a balanced trainer and put myself in the same category because I don't train dogs that way. I do not train dogs that way. While I will correct them, I want it to be fun. I don't want a battle every day. No, thank you. Their entire learning curve is not based on corrections. And when you're looking at the thugs, as you just called them, (laughs) everything is taught with a correction. Yes. And that's, that's so totally not what a true balanced trainer does. Thank you, Jill. Things so are... it's the teaching process. Yeah. So I think to be truly balanced, it should all be getting taught probably very similar to how our, the other extreme, the other side would purely positive. Mm-hmm. It needs to be fun, games, food, rewards. Yep. And then if the dog doesn't make it the whole way there to the end goal with that, then there's another layer that comes in addition to the other stuff. Yeah. And at that point to me, that's when there's some pressure put on. And then when they completely refuse to do something that you know that they know, then that is when a correction is warranted. I always like to talk about the word lime, something that Joe would squeeze into a margarita. (laughs) I would, I, I always say least invasive, most effective. Yep. Like, I love that. Like the positive people have Lima and they're like, they talk about being a Lima dog trainer, but I, I like Lyme. Like I'm, I, I really subscribe to that. The least invasive, the most effective that requires you reading the dog. Like I was working with some students on signals and signals are one of those pieces in utility that if you get it wrong, you're going to pay for it. Like you're going to pay for it. Like you will deal with poop face in signals. And the minute you have poop face, good luck getting a, a signal. Like, good luck. My, my go-to correction for a bad signal tends to be just spatial pressure. I cannot tell you the amount of people that as they start walking towards their dogs, they get a head turn away, or they get an ears back, or they get licking, or they get all sorts of, like, stressy avoidance behaviors. I'm like, look, that's enough. You don't need any more. Stop. The dog already told you that's enough. Yep. Get it. They got the point. Ask for the signal again. They ask for the signal and they get it. And then they can break off and reward. And all it took was them to walk forward four steps. Yeah. You didn't like, have to go the whole distance and physically and correct them. Dog. Yeah. You didn't have to do any of that stuff. And so, like, when we talk about trying to keep attitude in the competition ring, like, you have to learn to read your dog. I feel like, for me, like Monique was saying earlier about feel and timing, there's a lot of great trainers with feel and timing. There's also a lot of people that are learning to do this that don't have those things. And so for me, it's trying to figure out how to take some of the feel and timing out of what we do. But I can't, I might be able to take some timing out, but I'm not going to be able to take out you reading the dog. If I'm going to remove the correction, you've got to read the dog. And that's very hard for a lot of people. Yeah. I always think back to how did we all learn our feel and timing? Because none of us started out with the skill at the level we currently have. Do you think it's having a number of different dog types? Like some of the big successful trainers search for a specific dog. Yes. A specific type of dog. Yeah. I've had them. I haven't had a super strong, strong dog. Maybe one almost. I've had to learn to train 
all sorts of different types of dogs, personality types. And I think that teaches you a lot about learning to read a dog. If all you ever get is a strong male whatever. With work glad, ethic. Yeah. Yeah. Then that's, you just, they just do the job. You push them to do the job and they do it. You don't have to have that ability to read what they're thinking. The dogs with true work ethic allow all of this training to continue because they just suck it up and do it despite. Yeah. I agree with you. You never have to learn how to read them. You can just push through. Try that with an Italian greyhound. Yeah. We're Basset Sheltie. hound. Sheltie. Yeah. There's these other breeds that that just ain't going to work for. Come yeah. trial day, they walk out and pee on their scent articles of go ahead, mother. Yeah. It's just not going to work. I always, I contribute girly to so much in my life that was so good. And she was the hardest dog I ever trained. And I helped put a notch on her grandfather, four uncles, like they were strong, hard dogs. <laughs> and then, so I, when I get this dog, I'm expecting strong, hard dog. And she was from eight weeks on, she was just like, let's sit on the couch and eat pork rinds, dad. She's like, I don't want to do all this stuff. You, do you think yeah. it was us though? Because I got Pippa coming off of Reggie, right? So Reggie was such a tough dog, like. He made me work for everything I got. And I think control-wise, I was always just a couple of steps behind him of getting it. So I would get closer to getting like full control. And just as I was almost there, he'd get stronger. So I was always just slightly behind the eight ball. So after Reggie, I came in used to controlling this big, strong, powerful male. So I softened with my cute, sweet little girl, but not nearly enough. I think I was probably... In, in my soft form with Pippa when she arrived, I probably was still like a tyrant just because I was used to being with Reggie. And I wonder if that happened a bit with you with Gurley. Like, we just weren't prepared for these sweet girls. Possibly. It's definitely a possibility. She taught me how to soften. Like, she's like, look, I'm not going to do this for you if you're going to be you. I need you to not be you. I need you to soften and, and come down to my level. And we had this conversation about biting. Like, you were like, I, she desperately wants to bite you. And I was like, I'm never going to let that happen. And then when I realized that I had squashed her communication style and I, I started letting her do naughty things and nip at me and bark at me and it wasn't the end of the world, our relationship really changed. And she's just, she placed at every tournament she went to. She was high in trial at Florida's dock off competition and she just, she was a wonderful dog. Like she could read a dog better than any dog I've ever owned. I really miss so many of her little traits that I could use in my business. And there's just, she had an impeccable temperament and just so many good things. But she made me change. She said, You're coming off Brandy who did nothing but teach you how to win. That's all she did. And she's like, if you want to win with me, you're going to have to change. And I wonder how many people never get that lesson. And I had a good support system of people that were like, look, it's okay to change. It's okay to soften. It's okay to do these things. Try new stuff. Don't just pretend it all. Learn new things. And I credit Gurley for a lot of that because she forced me to not be me. And I, to this day, when I go around the country, so many people are getting her lessons. And I think that's the thing with balanced training that I'm seeing is that for a lot of the pet dogs they're getting, they're able to just push through. Even when they shouldn't be, they're still just pushing through at the cost of the dog. And they're not reading to see what different approach might be needed just seeing the damage that they're doing in the process, they're just too busy thundering along on their path. My buddy Jerry, who does far fetch with me, he is one of these pet dog trainers where every video of the dogs that you see him with, they're happy. The dogs are happy. The dogs are having fun. He enjoys it. You can see it, the passion. And if you're not subscribing to the Nature Coast Dog Trainer, you should because you can see what we're talking about. You can, he videotapes 
everything he does with these dogs and he puts it out there and for their owners and and he's the only pet dog trainer i can watch like the only one jerry is a guy that he let me play with his male pointer and this dog's super strong i'm watching him with jerry like wow and i took the dog to play with him and there was nothing there and i I, t- I when I handed it back to Jerry, I'm like, wow, you're one hell of a trainer. Because he <laughs> made this dog look like a powerhouse. He built this dog to be that. And that's what a good trainer should be. We know how to build. We know how to take it away when it's needed. We're always just seeing the void and adding so it's not noticeable to others. And you just made a perfect point of balanced training. You need when to t- You need to know when to take it away and you need to know when to add it back it's like yeah. sitting on a, a pendulum yeah and you're just trying to find that perfect balance between the two you go yep. one way or the other and it falls apart you fall off yep. like when i trained with you guys in vancouver island the the it there was never a question to me about does your dog love what they're doing the the dogs may may have had some deltas like they might not front straight or they might not do maybe they weren't ready for articles or things like that but i never felt like that there was none of this discussion about your dog hates this yes to make him love this like there was none of that and i think that's something that we all as dog trainers that present ourselves out in the out in the world i want to see a dog that looks happy when I take Ray around and I and she's doing her prancy little heel work and she's doing cute stuff, knocking over gates and all kinds of stuff, barking at me and things like that. Everybody's, they're like, why do you allow her to bark at you? Why do you allow her to bite at you? And and I'm like, because she's never going to give me that in the ring. When the pressure of the ring hits, behavior diminishes. So I need all of her. And I need to let her be okay with bringing all of herself to me. And then I'll let the ring, the attrition from the ring, take her down a notch or two. That way I don't have to. I know where we're headed. Like, I know what the ring does. It take it, it will take dogs down. The pressure of it will. So all my training with her is bring your attitude. Bring your, give me all of yourself. Let's figure out how to bring you up if you start feeling stressy. That's all I train. Like, fronts and finishes are easy. It's come out of the crate like a horse out of a, a stall at a racetrack. It's jumping on me and biting me and playing race games and racing into the ring gate so that way we don't, you don't feel the pressure of the gates. That's all it is. No, if I have this... the attitude, then I don't have to put in a bunch of corrections. The ring will take it out. Sylvia had always said that coming to my place and seeing the dogs here, the same as what you just said, everyone's happy, everyone wants to work. There may be pieces missing in that, but the relationships with the handlers are always good. And I just assumed she was bullshitting. (laughs) And it wasn't until I started traveling around the country that I realized what she meant. Like, Sometimes you travel into other places, you go trial somewhere and you're seeing the dogs in a different pocket of the world, different, not the world, because Europe's all like this. Europe, they all have good attitude that I've seen. But in Canada and USA, you go somewhere else and all the dogs are just squelched a little bit. It's really hard to see. People have forgotten how much fun it should be. Yeah, go ahead. Not in Calgary. Not all of the dogs are like that. No. When you're traveling around, yeah, but we, but yeah. we definitely are seeing. And I don't know. I think with the good trainers, they if they have a dog that's like that that they can't get over it with, they get a new dog. And the new trainers, if they continue to create dogs like that, they need to look inward and do something about their training. Yeah. If that is consistently what you're putting out there, a dog that doesn't want to do what you're asking them to do, doesn't want to heal with you, doesn't want to do anything, then that's on you if it's a consistent thing. Exactly. We as trainers need to train what we get. Mm -hmm. If you break your Christmas present, you don't get another one. Fix it. 
(laughs) (laughs) You're stuck with this for 12 years. Fix your errors. (laughs) Temperament sucks. Too bad. How are you going to fix that temperament? That's what makes you a trainer. Competition trainers tend to focus so much on what's going to lose them points. So they don't want barking. They don't want forging a little bit. Not you, Jill, but other people. Um, (laughs) Thank thank you for clarifying that. (laughs) And he managed to burn you just like that. Just like that. (laughs) Look, I've got a couple of episodes to to make up for. So I also, I see people that are so worried about competing, but the Och campaign is nothing but about attitude. Yes, you got to have straight fronts and finishes. Yes, you've got to stay in position for healing. But the right attitude will give you all of those things. Brings precision. Yes. Sylvia Bishop right there. And I spent towards Sylvia's end of her career here in the States we had her like six or seven times. And I do remember so much of what she said because she made me want to jump off a cliff because <laughs> everything we did, she wanted us to do the opposite. Yeah. And it's like, hold on. We couldn't have been this bad. We've been pretty successful. But it wasn't until I realized she's the one who made me finally realize change yourself is what the lesson she was trying to give us. Change yourself. And ask for for more, like you want more from the dog. What more piece do you need? Do you need the attitude? Do you need precision? Do you need, do you have the right attitude to ask for precision? I really feel like there's a lot of balance trainers that in the competition world that are more worried about points and what AKC's rules say or CKC's rules say, than they're worried about the attitude to keep the points. If your dog has a good attitude, everything else really is just something simple to work on. I always talk about Peter and Connie Sherrick. They are phenomenal trainers from Germany. And every time I go, they're doing different stuff that I've never seen before. And last time I was there, Peter's always pushing the envelope. He wants more and more. So it's not about the points. He wants more attitude in every exercise. So... He's teaching them to jump bigger, wider, faster. Everything's just always better. Like he's not training for points. He's training beyond that. Anyhow, last time I was there, he's teaching the dogs to jump into front. And I'm standing there and I'm watching him with his dog. And he'd do a little jump backwards and the dog would jump with him into a sit. It was so cute. And then he would sit the dog, call the dog in and do a jump. And then somebody would be holding his dog away and call him in and jump at the last second. And then before you know it, he's just calling the dog in. And then that last step that the dog's collecting, he's actually jumping and slamming into a sit. It's unbelievable. But he's always pushing for more, but more in the way of joy. Show me faster, happier, freer. And I love that. That's how we need to be thinking over here. Not about points. Change the picture so everyone wants to come and watch you in the ring. Yes. Matthew said something just a minute ago that stuck with me. And that was, if you have attitude, you can work on everything else for those points. If you don't have any attitude, you don't even have a dog that you can work on straight fronts with. Because they're not going to move. If you have attitude, you can always ask for better of everything. And for me, repetition is a big deal for me. So there's a lot of trainers that don't like to talk about repetition, but I love repetition. And I want to know that my dog is the same dog on rep 10 as they are on rep 1. And getting there, the first thing that a young dog is going to learn from me is how to accept that repetition. And it's not all sit, wait, get set, sit, wait walk away, do a front 10 times. That's not what we're talking about. We're taking the behavior chain and all those little links in that chain. How can I drill the shit out of those little links? Not the whole chain, just the little link. So like I can throw a cookie, call them to front, feed them four times for that good straight front, send them back to a manners minder. I, I dispense a cookie. They run back to the manners minder. They get a cookie. I call them to front, like really excited. Front, front, front. Here they come. They come fronting. They come in. They land their front. They look at their focal point. I wait and hold my breath a little bit, and the dog pushes into me again, and that's where I feed them. 
which is modified Sylvia. Sylvia always did step back front. Yep. I just make the dog push into me again, like yep. push again. So you feed on the second one. Then you send them back to the manners minder again. And it's just running for cookies all the time, but you're getting in this repetition. And what's interesting about dogs to me is that it doesn't matter if everything is positive, everything. It, they're running, they're cookies, there's not a lot of pressure. At some point, that dog's going to worry about that repetition. And when they worry about it, that is not the time to quit. But it's also not the time to correct them. Right. Like, it's the time to let, it's like, all right, no, we're still playing a game, buddy. Modify the game a little bit. Maybe take a collar and rev them up a little bit. But there's so many people that when that hits, that moment where the dog says, I'm a little nervous, why are we still doing this? They, they either A, quit, which is wrong, or B, they correct the dog. The dog's already correcting themselves. Yeah. They're nervous about something. This is not the time for a correction. I don't like double negatives, and I see a lot of double negatives. So the dog's licking avoiding and we're going to correct him again and it's whoa, whoa 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 the dog's already correcting itself let him sit in that mindset for a minute let him correct themselves and let him come out on the other side of that like i want them to come out so interesting i had a really sweet lady with a flat coat last weekend and she's a dear friend and she's working hard and she's got she doesn't have easy dogs like they're not easy the dogs are a little stressy they struggle with pressure and she's done a phenomenal job with these dogs. So I, I'm wanting to send her a shout out. But I took food and everybody wants to blame food for so many things. Like the balance people always want to get rid of the cookie. I, I, I don't want to get rid of the cookie. I can create just as much stress with the food. Let's just simmer down on the food. I'm like, look, I can slather your ass with liverwurst and your dog's still going to make all these mistakes because the repetition is going to hit them. They're going to get bored of their motivator at some point. We've got all this food. We start walking around. The dog's not getting all the rewards. There's no talking. There's no looking at the dog. Guess what starts to happen? The dog starts stopping. She, and we're holding handfuls of food here. The dog's, I can't heal anymore. It took, I don't know, 20 rounds before that dog decided, maybe I should just go up and get a cookie. But in those rounds where that lady's just walking around the ring and the dog's standing there looking at her like she's lost her mind, that dog's correct in itself. So I didn't have to correct the dog. Guess what starts to happen? The dog wants to find reinforcement. So the dog goes and finally gets a cookie for getting into position. That one piece of reinforcement that we had been doing before the stress of the repetition with the reinforcement kicked in, now the dog's getting more rewards and more rewards. And by the end of it, the dog's pushing off its rear and lifting its front feet up. And it's this is why balance training has got to change a little bit because everything's not a nail. That dog was already correct in itself. I didn't have to get involved. And I'm like, look, don't get involved. One, we don't have timing good enough to get involved. So let's just leave it alone. Let her figure out that, she, that what's happening here is not reinforcing. And let's let her figure out how to find reinforcement. And the total change in that dog, it took 22 and a half minutes, but 22 and a half minutes was actually very small in comparison to what would have happened had we started correcting on this dog. We'd have set ourselves back six, seven, eight weeks. So like, it was just, it was one of those times where I'm like, let's just read the dog. Watch. She's stressing herself out. You don't need, you don't need to get involved. I have a belief that any pressure, any problem that is caused with pressure cannot be fixed with pressure and likewise if it's a problem that's been caused by reinforcement it cannot be fixed with reinforcement Agreed. and maybe that's much too simple of a statement to make but it does often hold true jill you're going to say something and i cut you off um i don't know it's gone do you have ice in your mouth no nope. <laughs> <laughs> take a sip I do not have ice in my mouth. I don't know what the solution is. Like new trainers need mentors. Yes. And I think maybe somehow, and I don't quite know how this is, but maybe we have to expand our dog communities. So our regular students that are working with us, maybe we need to start get, getting them to mentor some other newbies coming in. So... But here's the thing. The thing is that we're seeing all these 
harder, newer trainers. I know. Maybe their mentors are hard. They were, yeah. And oh, so, like, I get what you're saying, yeah. But it's, and again, there's a time and a place for correction. There definitely is. But I think people are wanting this picture. In the sport of obedience, it's become so boring to watch some of these poor dogs out there. There needs to be some life put back in it. Like, the way it currently is, I can't imagine many new people joining in. It, it definitely does look fun. No, as a pet dog person, I wouldn't be going in there saying, wow, I want my dog to look like that. I but there are a lot that, that do. They just watch a dog trailing along behind somebody off leash, and they think that's amazing. They, they, Actually, you're not I wrong. did at the beginning. You are right. You are yeah. I was like, wow, the dog stands still for a stand stay. Yeah, you're right, Jill. Exactly, yeah. But it, I think that the things that drew me to the sport of obedience was how cool it was that I could communicate with another animal. And it was, it's always been about how I can communicate. Like, humans are not great at communicating with each other. So, like, the thought that we're going to talk to another animal is really quite comical. Like, it's, it's quite comical because we can't even communicate with each other. But at the same time, that was what drew me. And then when I would see the complex things that the dogs could learn to do, I was fascinated by the complex behavior and, and I immersed myself in it. Like I just wanted to be with dogs all the time. What I really wanted to do with my life was to study wolves in Yellowstone. That's what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to sit out in sub-zero temperatures because I hate heat and I wanted to watch wolves. That's what I wanted to do. And that sounds so simple to just want to watch somebody to pay me to watch wolves. But that's what I, that was my life plan. And, and when I, that happened, I went to domesticated dogs. And I find that w trying to figure out how to build a dog that wants to give and give. And, and it's been a journey for me. Like, not all of my dogs start. I've always had great dogs, but I've never. And what I mean by great is dogs that could go compete. But I've n not always had the look that I wanted. And with Ray, I had to figure out how to get that look. And that look made me, that her mother taught me, was to change and think of only her attitude. And don't think about front. I didn't even teach Ray fronts until she was two. Because I was afraid I'd show her too soon. Which clearly has not been the case. I did just finish her CD. Don't giggle. I just finished her CD with a 199 at high trial. Good. <laughs> I'm just giggling because I'm Jill in the same boat. Jill has always had amazing attitude with all of her dogs. She has. Even when, even with Sizzle's weirdness. Yep. There was never a question about their relationship. Yep. And I she really just couldn't believe handle the, the stress of the ring. I really believe that relationship is simply clear communication. If you ask anybody that's been married or divorced or in a domestic partnership or whatever they want to call it, what do you fight about the most? Not communicating right. I thought and, it was money. And it could be <laughs> if you spend, if you spend yeah. $1,700 on a new puppy and you don't Not tell communicating your about money. <laughs> but truly, like, it's communication. And that's what a relationship is, clear communication. So, like, for me, I think that's what balanced trainers should be focused on is teaching these people, look, I'm going to work with you the best I can. And... I need to teach you how to communicate with your dog. You won't believe them, the people that don't want their dogs to bark. They're terrified of barking. And I'm like, but your dog needs to bark. I was like, maybe that's because they've seen Harry. <laughs> I had Shelton. I had Shelton. If anybody should be terrified of barking, it's me. But, but my, my dog's all right. I'm always like, what's a big girl say? She barks and then I throw her into heel work. She barks and I throw her into a dumbbell retrieve. She barks, we do articles. Like, I, I didn't get up any barking in the ring. Yeah. Like, it, it, you got to stop being afraid of what could happen and just realize that your goal is your dog's attitude. Barking yeah. makes them active. So if your dog's going passive on an exercise and you want to wake him up, do barking right before you do ask for the exercise. It's a super way to make them active and change their attitude. And like Ray's been going around the country since she was eight weeks old. 
And at eight years old, she's the same dog. And I, I think that's hard to achieve sometimes for a lot of people is, are you the same dog all the way through your life? Or do you, or does pressure attrition take its toll through all the training and the seminars and the demos and all that stuff, the trials? And do you fall to that? It like, never has with any of Jill's dogs. No. And I think that no. that's a mark of something brilliant. I think it's something brilliant. And I think that it, those of us that really are passionate about obedience, passionate about the dogs, we see that and we realize that we have our own deltas and our own deltas are not wanting to explore what might be great instead of just good. We're afraid of it. Like we spend all these hopes and dreams on a puppy and we'd rather just do status quo stuff like that we know works. Oh, I won't. But, but what you might find is if you push yourself a little bit, and let your dog be free and run and have a good time, you might find a dog that blows your mind. But that is why we get dogs, right? We get them to enjoy them. And I think we all have to remember that again. Yeah. I think that we've got to, with balanced training, I, I love a lot of trainers that don't train like me. Like, I, I love a lot of them. And I'm okay with them not training like me as long as I can look at their dog. And what I mean by look at them is I can enjoy watching them. Yep. They're like, not the dog know, that you go get a coffee on. And I want to see that. I want us to see more of that. And I want to see more people that get that teaching that or giving it away. Like for me, I'm a teacher. Like I'm just a, I, I'm a clinician. I'm a teacher. Nothing that I have has ever been sacred to me. So like when I like my directed jumping method that I that's uniquely mine or my moving stand that's uniquely mine. I want people to take it. I want them to use it. I want them to teach it. Um, it's fun. It, it's more, it's less stress on the dog. I want them to do those things. And I don't have an ego about somebody using it. And they're like, oh, I learned this from so-and-so knowing it was mine. I don't care. Like, I, I don't care because I know that it's a much easier method on the dogs. The dogs are going to have more fun. And I'm going to feel good about that. And so I, I think that people that know how to use pressure and get attitude that don't share that, I think that's a disservice because when we hoard all this stuff to just ourselves, then it doesn't get out there how to make this work. And then people keep doing status quo and it stays divided. Like it stays people over there that do things that I don't like and people on the other side doing stuff that I don't like. And we're stuck here in the middle alone. We have to teach everything we know, otherwise this knowledge literally dies with us. It does. And the people that taught me have been so incredibly generous with their knowledge. And it's funny because they give me everything, but each time I go, I'm only able to take about 10% away. And I remember yeah. that 10%. So they're safe by giving me 100% of everything because I'm only going to take the pieces I'm able to take. And by the time I go back again, and then I get another 10%. Maybe I get more. I might get 30%. But they've improved at that point. They're further ahead at that point. So I'll always be behind them. They can give me 100%. And it doesn't mean I can be their competition per se. Jill, do you feel like as somebody that is a hobbyist that, that does like competition obedience, do you see in your area... The people that have like really flashy, fun dogs, do they require people to give them a lesson or take a lesson? But Or do they sit around ringside and talk about, oh, you should try this and blah, blah, blah. How does it work in your area? You mean, are they offering advice for free or are they making people take a lesson yeah. from them? So you mean? No. Yeah. People around here, I can't think of anyone around here that if somebody came up and asked, they would say... I will book you a private lesson. Everybody around here is quick to offer advice. I, yeah, I've never, I've never seen that as a problem. The only thing I've seen is oftentimes people will come up and ask as you're warming up your dog. And like people, aren't, people aren't always warm and fuzzy about saying, come talk to me when I'm finished my time in the ring. And that can turn people off, turn some new people off. 
it can. I, I actually have a longtime student that wanted me to film their run. I was getting ready to go. And I'm like, I'm not a videographer right now. I'm a dog trainer. I can't do that. In fact, I don't even want to talk to people when I'm warming up. I got to give my dog my 100% focus. It's not me trying to be rude. It's just. But your students are going to realize that. It's the new people that are there observing yeah. that come up yeah. and ask. And if you're short with them, that's a big turnoff to the sport. I try, to make a, I try to make a big deal about saying to people, you're more than welcome to come and see my dog when I'm done in the ring and ask me any questions you've got. But right now I'm just getting ready to go in, so touch base with me in 10 minutes. Do you find that trainers in your area would shy away from suggesting like a correction to somebody that they're giving advice to? No. Okay. No. The, the people that I train with are very balanced. Calgary's an okay. amazing bed of dog trainers. Like the talent in Calgary, Alberta is shocking compared to everywhere else I've ever been. It's unbelievable how talented they are there. Yeah. We've got with some happy good trainers up here. dogs. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I wonder like how many people are getting advice from the, how do I say this? Monique, Just say this it. No, these are one of those hard pieces because I'm. It's I'll get backlash from it. But you have older trainers that train one way. They somebody walks up to them for advice, and the first thing they throw at them is a correction. Is that happening? Is that not happening? For me, I'm always like, I'd have to see it. Do you have any video? That's like the first thing I say to somebody, because. I don't want to give corrective advice on a hypothetical. No, I, I thought you meant are I, I thought you meant are the people around here against giving that advice? They're not against it if they know what's going on. Right. But would that be the first thing they would jump to? No. So I can remember when your first Och campaign, like you're going to go through a lot of bad advice. There's a lot of bad advice out there. Like your dog does something stupid and the advice is correct them. And yep. that's how it used to be. And now at dog trials, I barely hear anybody talking at all. Like it used to be like everybody just sat around talking and eating and running your dog and having a good time. And now it's a morgue. Like you can hear a pin yep. drop. Oh, yeah. And, and it's I, I think that cup, that lack of social peace coupled with crusty corrective responses is a big turnoff. Like it's a big turnoff. And I wonder if our older. Com exhibitors and, and competitors and trainers if they realize that is happening. I, I wonder if they realize it or if they could just say, hey, here's my card or shoot me, here's my Facebook page, just shoot me a, a video of your dog and, and I'll take a look at it for you. Like, I do that a lot. Granted, I'm also sitting on 35 videos I haven't watched. There's Send them Maddie's way. You won't get any response, but he's happy to have them come I, in his inbox. I eventually will watch it, I promise, but it just takes me a little bit. But I'm careful to give correction advice on a dog I haven't seen. And it's only common sense. I don't know if that well, makes me hippy dippy positive, but I'm way more comfortable saying, hey, throw food or, or hit your dog in the head with a cheese ball. I'm more okay saying that yeah. than I'm I would be. I'm careful giving correction advice on a relationship I haven't seen. Yeah. Because there's some people I'm never going to tell them to correct their dogs. I would, yeah. I would rather err on the side of, 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 of positive, yeah. 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 Than and, safer. And correct something that didn't deserve it and just caused more of an issue. And I feel like there is a big piece there in this whole what's happening to balance training. There are still a lot of people that will just give corrective advice off of a hypothetical and then th these people that have no timing or no feel we don't know that they've got time good timing or good feel they go home and they take this advice and then the dog looks disheveled and so it's really difficult for me like i see i used to see that a lot like i would see somebody say oh you need to do this and and i'm like you didn't even look at the dog yeah what if the dog's over here panting and licking and avoiding and the dog's telling you I've had enough. Like, it's but one of those things. This is exactly our topic, though. What happened to balanced training? It's no longer balanced. It's now often only pushing corrections. We don't or, need to see the dog anymore. 
you yeah. just fit into the same recipe. We're just going to push your dog through with more pressure. And that's and it, it can't always happen. You can't do the same thing to every single dog. You mm-hmm. have to know the situation. You have to know the handler, their capability, their relationship with their dog. The dog, it will the dog just fold. We know corrections will get results quicker. Yes. But we don't always need speed too. Like sometimes it's gonna come at such a great cost that I don't know. I find myself having less and less in common with balanced trainers and also positive reinforcement trainers. Like I don't fit into either area. Me either. And like, I work sheepdogs, and so they're always in drive. And so I have to correct them a lot more than I do obedience dogs. A lot more. I have a young dog here that is super nice. He's got lots of feel. And he it I spent a whole week letting him go in there with the sheep and doing whatever he wanted and not putting any rules to him so I could observe what his natural tendencies were going to be. The first time I put any little bit of pressure to him, his response was to not move. Which, in herding, that's not the response. So I stood there sh- shaking a flag up and down beside him, not touching him with it, but going up and down beside it. I didn't get, I didn't escalate myself. I just wasn't going to move the flag. It's going to keep flagging right here. And then finally, he, he just moved himself to get away from the flag. And once he moved himself, he was behind the sheep, and he was getting all the reward he wanted. I didn't have to get hard and strike him or do any of that stuff. I just had to maintain this annoying thing beside him. And he had to figure out on his own, I've got to move. And it's annoying sometimes. And But like just because he was in drive, his response was wrong. But it didn't warrant me to give him a bigger correction. It just, I had to be consistent. And I find that there's so many ways where we can just be consistent with our corrections. And that's well- a big correction than a wallop. When we did our last podcast with Kelty, just the three of us talking, Kelty's fantastic. It was so funny listening to Jill because Jill sounded exactly like Kelty. She did. And and I think in philosophy, Jill is exactly like Kelty. But honestly, guys, Jill's never allowed a German Shepherd and we won't even let her have a Corgi because Jill is the softest person with her dogs you're ever going to meet. But from that last podcast, she sounded like this tough ass of, yeah, they're going to respect me. And she she's did. so sweet. She says that as Prod is sitting on her head. Um, yeah. I'm good at pushing that on other people's dogs. I never said no, I did it with my own. No, <laughs> but your dogs respect you, Jill. Your Pardon dogs me? do respect you. You have a beautiful relationship with their dogs. Like it's. A wonderful thing. But it's funny because as we're all saying this, like Jill is so kind with her dogs always. But in philosophy, she's 100% bang on with me and Kelty. Like we all fully agree, but we go about it in such different ways. Jill's the softest of the three of us by far. Um, And that's, once again, what balanced training should be. Jill is perfect for her dogs. There isn't one recipe. Like, we all need to have the softness that we need to have for the dogs we have. And sometimes we need to be able to pull out that hardness, but not all the time. And then we have to keep floating back to middle where we're all living in harmony together. Yeah. And it was so funny to to watch Jill, Kelty give Jill so much confidence. Like, I, I called Monique and I was like, Oh my God. I said, listen to Jill. I was like, Kelty is Jill's security blanket. <laughs> no, they're old friends. For sure. Yeah, I, did, I didn't feel like I had any change in confidence. It was just really easy to talk to Kelty. Of course. And I think this is also your ballpark too, because like often we're talking behavior and it's not your wheelhouse. When we were talking breeds, you were totally vocal because that is your wheelhouse. So you have different strengths than I have, and it shows when we're talking. Yeah. And that's but good. It was a beautiful way to, I always tell people, like, I can't train with a lot of trainers. Like, a lot of people are like, you don't so-and-so because you don't train with them. That's not the case. I, I know me. And so in knowing me, I know that I have an Italian temper. I know <laughs> that I can be loud. And I know that I, I have that tendency to, for my aura 
to scream at my dog. Like, I can make a, a dog wince while I'm playing with it. Like, I'm playing. And the dogs, I feel you're a lot of person. So I have to soften that. And so I can't train with people that are really hard. Because if I do, yeah. then I, I mimic their behavior. And it's, so I, I don't go there. And a lot of people are like, yo, you don't like so so It's not about me like in anybody. I love, I don't really have a trainer I can think of that I really despise or things like that. Like I just don't have I that. can think of one. <laughs> um, Stop it. Let's move on. <laughs> they say that meaning that I would never train with them. Yeah. And it's not that I don't like them. It's that if you are already have hammer tendencies, you don't need to train with other hammers. Like you I just agree. <laughs> a hammer should train with a feather. Yes. You're right. It brings the perfect balance to everyone. Balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. balance that magic word yeah mm -hmm. and, and like, i agree because if i'm training around people that are heavy-handed yeah i don't watch i, I, I won't watch because even if you don't mean to you pick things up what is what you do maybe to a much lesser extent but you will end up imitating what you're watching it's if it's not good training don't watch it yeah and so it's, i tell people all the time is look dogs don't learn in the application of pressure they learn in the release of it. So a good balance trainer's goal should always be to be applying enough pressure that gets the point, but also your goal is to let it go. That's your goal. Like, I don't want to hold pressure. I want to let it go. And, and discovering what let it go means for a lot of people is really difficult. Like, I see people that lean over top of their dogs to give a cookie on a front. So you're going to correct and then feed. And how many dogs do you see back out of a front? A lot. Yeah. Even if they just scooch back a little bit, you're correcting your front. A quick story about pressure that you don't even know is happening and, and learning to read dogs. I had a, a Labrador that was blowing signals occasionally. What was happening was left turns were putting spatial pressure on the dog. And we didn't discover it till we saw video. On his left turn, he starts licking, dropping his head a little bit. His head position changed. And then he wouldn't do his signal. So his left turn, stand your dog. She'd leave. She'd go down. He wouldn't do his down signal. But every left, every time she set him up, it was get set and slap her leg. Guess what she was doing? Putting pressure on the dog before she asked him to perform. And so we weren't getting 80%. We were getting. 60%. And on signals, he's stressing about, you've set me up this way earlier. We did all this healing. We go to the left turn. I'm a little stressed because you're now putting up more spatial pressure on me. And then I go to do the signal. He couldn't do it. If the dog did a right turn or an about turn, he could do a signal. Huh. So it's when it, there's so many little pieces where novice hand don't know if you're not always looking to release the pressure or starting to try to watch what creates pressure to a dog you might miss something like that if you're not looking to release pressure all the time and you're just applying it then you're, you're probably going to miss something like that i think uh, in a lot of i'm talking pet dogs now the balanced trainers i'm seeing and i am going to say younger ones Oh, maybe I'm being mean here. There's just not that introspection and awareness. They're not looking back thinking, oh, is this good? They just assume everything they're doing is great because yeah. Instagram tells them as much. So yeah, there they, is no introspection yeah. or looking at videos and actually, but looking at them with a critical eye of, oh, his tail went down there. Why did it go down? Yeah. He's licking his lips. He looked away. They're not caring about any of that stuff. They're just seeing the big picture, not the details. Yeah. Oh, look, he stayed. Yep. Well, yes, that's because he doesn't want to walk anymore. Yeah, it's. It, it was interesting also this weekend, that something that happened. I just love talking to you guys about behavior. And one of the things I found interesting was a, a friend of mine has a dog that it was following her in on signal. And so we just did the signal, we stood the dog. And we walk to the other side of the ring, and I'm like, don't give her any information. Just stand there. And I would say it was about, I don't know, 39, 49 seconds. The dog comes barreling into her owner. 
And I said, what was she thinking about? Where reinforcement is. Reinforcement is with mom. I like to run. I get cookies for fronts. She was not thinking. I, I wanted to see the dog anticipate the down. <laughs> and the dog didn't. And I'm like, there's your problem. As like, it, it was fascinating to me. Like, sometimes I think that a lot of balance trainers would do good to not do. I always want to see people doing things, but sometimes when you get to a spot that you don't know what to do, nothing. I agree. Let the dog, let the dog tell you where its mind's at. I, I think that we need to listen to dogs more. I think, I think another good thing too is if you really like your pinch collar and your e collar, make yourself go without it for a week. And if you really rely on your bait pouch and your cookies, make yourself go without it for a week. I'm seeing more people struggle with weaning off corrections than I am seeing, seeing a dog that needs to be weaned off food. I cannot tell you how many dogs I see that, that if you don't pop them before you start healing, they won't heal. I think that's a habit for a lot of people. It's a... But it becomes a work cue. I know. Yep. I, I have clients struggling with it. I'm, I'm being like, nice, not saying their names. <laughs> I'm like, you've got to stop this. You've got to stop this. Yeah. Like, you've got to stop popping to get work. Because what's happening is these dogs actually know how to heal. Yeah. But the problem is not deep or, or big. Yeah. You pop start them all the time. It's like yeah. pulling a train on a lawnmower. Yep. And I'm like, when are you going to realize that it's the pop that you have to pop this dog to make it work? If people would just start thinking more towards trial, do you get to do that in trial? No. Therefore, make sure you don't do it in training sometimes. But it's just a lack of awareness, I think, of what they're doing. It's just habit. They just keep doing it and doing it. It is. And I think that's some of the older trainers that are so used to just doing that aren't seeing it. They're not seeing that this is not what we need to be doing. So I'm going to say something, and I'm going to be bad by saying it. Oh, God. But I think an issue with clinicians coming in and out is that they're here for two or three days. They come with great ideas. They give you their heart and soul, and they fly away. And then they may come back in two more months, and they come in with great ideas, heart and soul, fly away. But what they're lacking is that thought in between that time about what you actually should be doing with your dog. So you're getting the same information every time, but you're missing the deeper uh -oh. layers. And I'm not I aiming that at you, thing. Matthew, because I actually don't think you are that person. But I do see that a lot. Oh. Is Once you fly away, you let those dogs go. <laughs> and Money. if you are not working with a regular instructor, you're missing that deeper level of instruction. Yes. And as a clinician, I do see that. I see people that I give them something. And then if I go back in a couple of months or six months or a year, they're, it's the same conversation again. And, it's just, and I've been taking notes on all like my private lessons and some of the clinics on my phone. And I do this because my memory is not as good as it used to be. And I can't yeah. remember what I told people. And so I want to remember what I told them. So I've been taking notes on people. And in taking notes, I'm like, hey, we talked about this last year. And it's still not done. I'm like, this is something I needed you to get done. So I don't want to have this conversation about healing today because you still have that to do. And it's shocking how when I'm not there, they can't execute what I've the instructions that I've given them. But they can do what their regular instructor tells them regularly. So that's that it, you're right when it comes to clinicians and, and as a clinician, like there are definitely obedience clinicians are so much fun. Obedience clin clinics are so much fun, but the understanding, as you were saying about Peter and Connie, like you're taking away about 10% of it. Yeah. And for me, I, I designed my clinics to give you 105% of it. And so if you miss a piece, you've missed an important piece. So like, there's that. Um, Your healing workshop is one that I could see 10 times. Yeah, I a lot of people have. They go to it a lot. And it's because it's 
it, it was designed for all the little skills that I want a dog to have so that we don't bore them to tears in their heel work. Quick note, I am actually filming that at Tila's place in August. So it will be on DVD. Very cool. So yeah. Yeah, we talk a lot about purely positive trainers, sometimes in a negative light. I do consider myself a motivational trainer. My issue with purely positive trainers is the lack of goal focus. Yes. People are so happy just going through the motions of training forevermore. There's not that much focus on actually moving on. Or, or proving that you're actually doing something useful without food and all that. Yes. But I, I do like that they care about their dogs. Of I course. Love that. I love that they care about their dogs. And that's noble in itself. On the balance side, I like the goal-oriented part of it. And I like the fact that our dogs are smarter than monkeys and can, maybe not monkeys, but they are smarter than other zoo animals and they can learn from negatives and that we give them that opportunity. And that for me, every correction puts my relationship on the line. I don't take that lightly. I have to know that I'm being clear and that it is earned from a either lack of effort or um, a uh, type connection, I have to know that. And so, and, and then for it's me, it's lack of effort and lack of attention. Yes. And then it's, hey, I, I'm, I am going to put you in drive so that I know that I've given you every opportunity to do this right before I'm going to administer whatever correction I'm going to administer. Um, and I'm going to do it to where it doesn't ruin things I've already built. And I learned that from Gurley because you could ruin it. I just wish a lot more balanced training would think like that. That would be nice. I think there are, and I think there probably are a lot of us that feel this way, but we're all feeling alone. We haven't yet connected to realize that there's a whole lot of us. It's a really hard conversation to have. It's like saying, hey, we, we identify as balanced trainers, but there are balanced trainers that have dogs that look awful. And I don't I identify with most balanced trainers. I don't. I, say I would stick it, myself it, as a relationship-based trainer, not a balance now, because I'm so unhappy with what I'm seeing. Yes. Yes. But with, before we had new words, yes, like we were all like, I'm a balanced trainer, but I'm not like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like I've had I've had people say when I had Nick the Golden, I showed him one time a disastrous time in St. Pete. Like he just took advantage of all the fun that he could take in the <laughs> ring with me. And it was absolutely a blast. Like it was the funnest time I've ever had in the obedience ring. So like the fact that he's acting like a donkey, I'm sitting here laughing the whole time. And and I heard somebody outside the ring say, He needs to be harder on that dog. And I just looked over and I was like, Hey, I know what I'm doing. I, I, I don't need you to tell me to be harder on an animal. He's having a good time. If winning is your only objective, then this sport, then this is going to make you a miserable person. Like, how could you look at that happy golden retriever that was just smiling and laughing the whole time he's in the ring? I couldn't even be mad at him. And I went back the next day and let him do it again. <laughs> Ray got high in trial. Four weeks ago, I was entered on Sunday. I didn't go back su Sunday. It just didn't matter. Like, I got what I came for. I didn't need to do it again. But Nick acted like a donkey, and I wanted him to do it again. Like, <laughs> it was fun. So it's like, it's got to be about not just being stuffy. Nick, at, for all intents and purposes, was absolutely atrocious. But he won the whole show. Everybody yeah. came to watch him. Dee Dee Rose always used to say that her best performances were like walking on a tightrope where she felt yeah. like she was just about to fall off and lose complete control. <laughs> but you just managed to stay on there. Is when the dog's that much on the edge and you're that much on the edge, those performances are such a rush. Such so a much high. fun. So much fun. Yeah. When you, when you awesome fall dog. off, it's a little... <laughs> Humbling. 
Um, who sold? Tumbling. <laughs> like, tumbling, but he wasn't my dog, so I was like, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> I ended up, that same dog ended up getting high on trial with me a couple of months later. Like, who cares? Like, Again, though, the those are the, the they're the riskier performances. It was so much fun. At, and they're the performances I want. Yeah. Yep. All right. We should call it a night, people. I've Thank you so much for coming back before. with us, Matthew. What are you eating? That's Kit Kat? Symphony bar. <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? <laughs> a symphony bar. It's so yummy. I've never I don't need it. One. My waist does not need it. Well, my, my happiness is on a 10 right now. See you guys next Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Jill, it's been Fun. a slice as always. As always. We'll see you next Tuesday. Thank Bye. you. Bye.